Thank you. Um, and, and thanks for the opportunity to present to the, uh, at the chapter meeting. Um, really excited to be here. Um, you know, I think this has been um, a topic that's been in the news a lot over the last year. And so I only have less than a year left in my appointment. Okay, so I, I operate with sort of a sense of urgency. Uh, I don't know if uh, I'll be on the, on the board um, after next January, but nevertheless, I, I want to do as, as much as I can to get the board's message out there, um, to work with uh, factual-based information, and, um, and to try and speak as directly and plainly as I can. Um, and is uh, Brian Whitehall in the room? Brian, so before you get that call, before you pass it on to me, if you could just take notes on this next slide. <laughs> first, right? And, I, and just, just to get that right out there, right out of the gate. What the board does not control water levels on Lake Ontario. Despite what you may have heard, we do not control lake levels. We manage outflows according to uh, conditions in, on the river. So if the... Uh, uh, if the Lake Ontario is, is the big bathtub, um, the St. Lawrence River is the very small drain. And so we'll get into a little bit about how that, how that works. Um, so on the International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board, I'm just going to go briefly over how the board operates and, and where, where that comes from. Um, some of the water uh, regulation infrastructure, uh, the role of Plan 2014, so this is the water regulation plan that just put it in, in place. Factors that contributed to the record high water in Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River in 2017, and also go over a, a hydrologic forecast, how it's used or how it's not used, as the case may be, um, and introduce the concept of Great Lakes uh, Adaptive Management. Um, so first we'll start with the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty. So this is a treaty between the United States and Canada for watersheds that are along the common frontier between the two countries, and it extends all the way from Maine through the Great Lakes and up to, to Alaska. So there's uh, a large number of watersheds that are, are uh, fall under this jurisdiction. And the, the board that, that I'm on is just one of, of many of those boards. So the, from, the, from the treaty comes the International Joint Commission. Uh, so there's a US section and a Canadian section. And the commission appoints membership on the board. Um, and um, hopefully the, the commission Commission's role is to look at water diversions, to look at water quality issues, but also to resolve issues really before they become disputes. Um, and on the on the Lake Ontario board, there are five U.S. members and five Canadian members, um, and there are also representatives from the governments. Uh, we call them regulation representatives, so like Army Corps of Engineer and Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, there's also an op operations advisory group that represents uh, hydro and seaway and other interests. And then there's uh, a communications committee. So in addition to being on the board, I also sit on the communications committee. And lastly, we'll go into we'll get into a little bit about Great Lakes adaptive management and how that contributes. So just to populate the list of the board, and um, some of you may be familiar with some of these folks. Um, and there again, there is equal membership on both sides. And um, a, the, a great deal of the the heavy lifting of the technical information comes from the reg reps. So um, you may recognize some of these some of these names from. Um, the Army Corps or from the uh, Environment Canada. So I just want to orient us with um, the watersheds that we're talking about. So this is the Lake Ontario watershed in green and also the St. Lawrence River watershed. Um, but also I wanted to mention the Ottawa River. Now this is um, this played a, a significant role in what happened last year. And just for context, the Ottawa River watershed is a more than 56,000 square mile watershed. Right, so that's larger than the entire landmass of the state of New York that drains in an unregulated system that drains down through one river. And this river, is, its confluence is right here um, at the head of the Montreal Ar Archipelago. So you have the, this massive watershed meeting with the St. Lawrence, um, and that certainly has an effect on flood conditions um, in, under extreme events. Uh, we'll just zoom in into some of the primary area of the, uh, that's um, by the project, uh, and we'll zoom in a little closer. So I just want to point out uh, some of the structures. There's the Iroquois flow control structure uh, near uh, Waddington, and on the inset there is the Long Sioux Spillway, um, the Moses Saunders Dam, and, and of course um, a, a series of locks um, for the navigation channel. Um, this is a picture of the Moses Saunders Power Dam. Most of you are, are quite um, intimately familiar with this facility. It's a 32 turbine facility. Um, between Messina and Cornwall. On the right-hand side, oops, 
on the right hand side uh, is operated by Ontario Power Generation, the left hand side by the New York Power Authority. So the board regulates discharges through this facility and the, when those discharges exceed the capacity of this facility, the surplus of that goes to the Long Sioux Spillway. Right? So this year, um, and this, this is a, a, an exceedingly rare event, um, the gates and the spillway open up uh, just to make just to make the full balance of those of those discharges. Uh, I also want to point out um, some of the lock structures, the navigation channel. Um, this is important because after the construction of, of the seaway, uh, the channel was dredged, so it had additional capacity for additional discharge. So um, that's a, crit a critical feature of the project. So the board's mandate is to regulate outflows in accordance with the supplemental order of approval. This put in place, uh, this replaced Plan 1958 D with deviations with Plan 2014. Uh, we can deviate from the plan under certain emergency conditions or operational operational adjustments, uh, including winter operations. So right now, um, we've been managing conditions on the St. Lawrence for uh, ice for ice conditions to prevent ice jams. Um, and you know, other changes that pop up as in, in accordance with certain you know, emergency situations. Um, the board meets in person four times a year, and we're supported by technical experts from the core, from Environment Canada, and the IJC, as I mentioned. Um, and also, important point here: all board actions are driven by consensus. So, um, whatever happens, all all members of the board have to agree on a course of action to take. Um, I just want to point out historic Lake Ontario water levels. Um, vertical line in the middle, um, separates pre-project from post-project. And throughout the history of operate, um, uh, the modern history, there has been not only extreme low flows, but extreme extreme high flows. And this tends to happen in a period of about every 20 years. And you can see, even, uh, even after um, the, high, um, the project was constructed, we still have um, <coughs> high water events. And certainly, these events have been well documented over the decades. Um, capping off with what we observed in, in 2017. Um, the board goes through various uh, methods for public outreach. This includes media interviews, um, so TV, radio, newspapers. Um, and also we um, have a, a, fa a Facebook page. Uh, there is uh, very, very frequent updates there. It's a great place to get further information about changes in flow um, and also any of the other issues that, that are, uh, people are, are dealing with. Um, we have, uh, there's, there's a question and answers um, 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 session on there also. Um, and they're, they're, they're very responsive with, with comments on this. So, um, But there, in addition to that, there's a board website um, with learning modules to explain how operations, um, how they work. Um, but also we, we answer a lot of emails and written letters and certainly personal communication within the communities. Uh, so in, in addition to public outreach, um, we've also participated in, in hearings. And I was interested in, um, in reading um, the U.S. Senate uh, testimony from 1976. So if anybody cares to read this, it's, uh, it, provides me, it provided me with a lot of insight, really, as a new board member. Um, and we also provided testimony at state Senate hearings in the past year, um, one in Oswego County and another. I provided, provided the board's testimony in uh, Wayne County. And I can tell you that um, from, from, from 1976, the script really has not changed a whole great deal. So um, if you get a chance to read that, I, really, I encourage you to. So I just want to um, highlight some of the types of, of um, um, hazards that were experienced last year. So these are some pictures from um, the, the South Shore uh, at Lake Ontario. And risks were driven by wind-driven waves, um, inundation, particularly in some of the embayments like uh, Sodus Bay and Aronaquit Bay. Um, and response was focused on, primarily on protection of uh, <coughs> property. And this contrasts with how response happened north of the, of the common frontier, north of the border. Um, while certainly inundation at the um, Toronto Islands, uh, near the city of Toronto. Uh, but downstream, in the, in the St. Lawrence River, um, and uh, of course in the Ottawa River, uh, response was fo focused on, on evacuation protection of human life. And in Quebec, um, there were, um, the estimates that I, that I saw from the province, uh, 4,600 people were, were evacuated from their homes. Um, about 3,500 homes were, were evacuated. Um, 150 municipalities impacted. So um, 
while there certainly was a lot of action happening here in the south, on the south shore of Lake Ontario, um, the same event, the same flooding event, very different type of response uh, in, in Canada. And I just want to talk a little bit about how outflows affect water levels. And uh, I think this might clear up some of the uh, some of the thoughts about this. And so if the goal, we're, if we're dealing with high water in Lake Ontario, and the goal is to reduce it by one inch, okay, that would mean we have to increase discharge by 820 cubic meters per second and sustain that increase for one week period. So this would have the effect of not only reducing Lake Ontario by one, one inch, but upstream of the project, Moses Saunders, there's a four bay called uh, Lake St. Lawrence. That reduces Lake St. Lawrence water levels by 15 inches. So essentially, so much water is going out, it's not able to refill fast enough. Um, in between Moses Saunders and Beauharnois in Quebec, a hydro-Quebec facility, is Lake St. Francis. The effect there is negligible. But downstream of Beauharnois, near uh, Lac Saint-Louis and uh, the Port of Montreal, the effect is the increase in water level by 11 inches and 12 inches, respectively. So if you're looking at of order of more than an order of magnitude of, of impact, a change in water levels with respect to very minimal reduction on on, water, on, uh, on Lake Ontario. So I think that it illustrates sort of the limits of the infrastructure, right? And we've been saying over and over again, water regulation alone cannot prevent flooding. It cannot. It just simply wasn't designed to handle this extreme volume of water. Um, let's talk a little bit about. Plan 2014 and some of the rules that are built into it. So, um, it's really it starts with supplies. Okay, water going into the system, and so that Lake Ontario water levels uh, also looks at water levels in the Upper Great Lakes uh, as an indication of water that's coming down. And so, usually that's about 85% of the water that's coming into the system. And then from there, there is a discharge that's calculated. Okay, and for the most part, this really is what we call a rule curve. There are a couple of correction factors or high waters going into fall, which we call rule curve plus, or exceptionally low waters throughout the year, what we call rule curve minus. But for the most part, when we're talking about supplies, um, we're dealing with, we're driven by what's called rule curve. And these icons are color coded for a reason, so we'll look them up later in another slide. Um, so, if, 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 so if water regulation is two-sided coin, go back. If once it heads is supplies, then tails would be the limiting factors in the St. Lawrence River. So here's an example of some of the limits that are, that are being applied throughout the year. So we have minimum flows for safe navigation. We have the I limit or ice limit. So um, flows within the St. Lawrence are, are slowed down so that uh, to encourage the growth of stable ice cover, right? And it's a critical part of hydro operations. Once that stable ice cover is, is established, then the flows can be jacked up and the water will move safely underneath the ice. But if you fail to do that and ice jams occur, um, that just throws a whole monkey wrench into operations and it's not good for anyone. Um, there's an F limit or like a flood limit and so that looks at uh, flood stage upstream and downstream, right? Um, so as Lake Ontario water levels increase, the allowable flood stage in Montreal also increases. <coughs> and lastly, there's an L limit, so that's the maximum outflow for safe navigation. Um, and this of course changes um, throughout, the, throughout the different times of the year. Um, has to do with the navigation profile. Um, so if we look at water levels on, on Lake Ontario, and we have elevation um, on, on the vertical axis, um, it really illustrates a, a, crit a critical point here that I think is, is um, told through the tale of, of three years. Okay? 2015 in gray, 2016 in red, and then 2017 in black. So what these have in common, these three years, is they all started out below the long-term average, so that's the dashed blue line. Um, but what they did after that moment uh, really had nothing to do with each other. And 2015 went critically low, but rebounded late. Um, 2016 in red um, gradually increased, you know, but not critically so. Uh, but then you might, some of you may recall that 2016 was a year of significant drought throughout much of the state, right? So likewise, long term, a below long term average um, of Lake Ontario water levels. So that really set the stage for 2017, right? So we're coming off of a year with significant drought, right? We're worried about water storage. We're worried about having enough water for hydro operations. And um, so initially, 
2017 tracked almost identically with the previous year, right? Not significant, not necessarily alarming at that point, um, but then the rain came. Right? That was really the game changer. And we run out of superlatives to describe the precipitation events of 2016, 2017, right? I mean, unprecedented and unpredictable. It doesn't even begin to tell the story. We really were talking about biblical, epic uh, uh, types of, of, of precipitation. And six to 12 inches of, of rain, of precipitation around the basin, not just in isolated areas, in one part of the basin or the other. That was not, it was beyond the Great Lakes, Lake Ontario, but also in parts of the Great Lakes. That's just a tremendous amount of water, and it has to go somewhere. Um, another way to show it, two times, so 2.7 times, uh, greater than what's considered normal, right? Um, and these types of events cannot be predicted with any, certain, any sort of accuracy. Uh, another way to show this, again, pointing out the location of the Moses Saunders Dam, records were broken around the basin. Um, Toronto, Rochester, Belleville, Ottawa, and, and Montreal. Um, so this is total precipitation from January through May, right, the first five months, right? And if you look, all these records were set in previous decades, not even in the same year. So we have never seen this type of precipitation event happening across the entire basin um, uh, in, this, in, this, in this amount of time. So now we're going to switch gears going from Lake Ontario elevation to outflow. So this is the discharge that's going through Moses Saunders. Um, red would be a pre-project discharge. <coughs> the gray squares are the plan 2014 prescribed flows. And the black line is the actual. So the actual discharges that were agreed upon by the board. So the difference of the two shows some kind of a, a deviation. Um, just to point out, back from the previous slides, these are all the options that are potentially available under plan 2014. Um, we may not have the authority to, to use all of them. Uh, and in fact, using some of them may be <coughs> catastrophic. But just, just, for, just to illustrate my point, this, these are the options that are available. All right, next, we overlay the actual and some pat patterns of immersion. All right, first, the first part of the year, ice management. And what you see is five freeze-thaw cycles where we're trying to grow ice, stable ice, and then it gets mild and the ice falls apart, it degrades. So we then have to try and grow ice again and again and again. So this added to some of the water that was being stored on Lake Ontario, but again, this is a critical part of operation. This cannot, this cannot be ignored. So, in the context of climate change, is this going to be a problem going forward? Absolutely. Um, so after those few months, that's when um, that, that, then the rain came, right? And the F limit applies, the flood limit. So we're holding back water because parts of Montreal are underwater. Thousands of residents are being displaced. Recall the earlier slide, okay? Um, and so we're holding back water. We're releasing water once the once the Ottawa freshet finally subsides, right, we're able to release more water, and then we get more rain on top of that. So um, certainly trying to stay current, uh, with battling conditions within the river system. Eventually, hydrologic conditions improve, and we're able to not only go above the rule curve, right, which is only, only cares about supplies. We're able to deviate above that, and um, these are the highest sustained discharges in the history of operation. After working with the St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation and Development Corporation, we were actually able to go above the L limit, which is the limit for safe navigation. Um, they, they used mitigation, mitigation to make sure that the shipping was safe. Uh, there were no passing lanes. There were speed restrictions. They also limited the types of vessels. I mean, this is basically a partial closure of the seaway. Right? But what, we were, what the board was able to accomplish uh, working with the seaway was higher discharges than what, than what was achieved in 93, another year with high, with high waters, where they actually closed the seaway and opened an alternating, alternating day. So uh, we were able to get more water out um, without having the devastating impacts on, on the sea, on, on navigate, <coughs> navigation. If there's a little bit of time uh, later, I, maybe I can get into that, into that a little bit more, um, just about how we um, process those impacts. Uh, eventually, hydrologic conditions continue to improve Record decline in Lake Ontario water levels, the greatest decline that we've seen in the history of, like I said, there's so many superlatives, right? Um, and we're actually tracking at the, the L limit for navigation, but rule curve and L limit, there's really a negligible difference. So even though we're at the maximum allowable for navigation, Plan 2014 still wants to get Lake Ontario down going into the fall, recognizing some of those risks. So forecast for 2018. Um, 
the point that I was making from the from the tale of the three years, right, is that where you start at the beginning of the year has no has has nothing to do with where you end up, um, where the peak level is going to be, right? But um, what do the forecasts tell us? Is they're saying there's a 50 percent chance that we could be back at long-term average, but there's also a chance we'll be at critically dry or critically wet. So, you know, these are very qualitative forecasts. It's extremely difficult to translate this sort of forecast into a quantitative discharge. Um, under the previous plan, the board certainly did have more discretionary authority to anticipate things, but what the reg reps will also tell you is that they did that with mixed results. So sometimes you can let too much water out, and then you're painting yourself into a corner, and you have to try and make up for it down the road. And that's extremely hard to do. Water levels are driven by hydrologic conditions, end of story. Some of the products, some of the informa uh, weather information that we get. So this is a, a mid-January event. Um, so it's a precipitation anomaly. To me, this has ice jams written all over it. And in fact, this is when we had ice jams in the tributaries of the St. Lawrence. Um, and all that information is kept up to date. Facebook pages are being uh, updated. So um, anyone who's interested can get pretty instantaneous uh, um, information on what's happening with the board. And also, after the Super Bowl was concluding, was concluded um, at midnight, um, discharge was increased from 8,600 to 8,550 cubic meters per second, or 312 12 cubic feet per second. That's, a, that's an incredible volume of water. And that's all, all being passed underneath the ice at this point. Um, and while we're doing that, we're actually putting Montreal at the beginning stages of the flood level, the effort. So we could go higher, but um, that would mean folks in Montreal would like to be underwater, or at least very close to it. Um, and lastly, Great Lakes Adaptive Management. Um, this is a community that works with, with all with other boards in the Great Lakes, so Niagara Board, Superior Board, um, and keep staying current and with the inputs of, of all sorts of uh, information about um, conditions, damages, um, but also impact uh, changes within the environment. So, I mean, under GLAM, uh, these are all the various inputs, and they're all equally important. So the board is just limited with how. Uh, what types of relief they can provide, and the consequences of providing those th that relief. Uh, but certainly, I just want to mention that uh, this one is, is, you know, I think mo a lot of people in this room are working on that right now. So um, that's incredi incredibly important input. Um, keep that, keep that going, because um, if you don't, no one else will. Um, and lastly, I'd, I'd like to mention, if I could go back to. Um, the 1976 U.S. Senate hearing, Henry P. Smith was the chair of the U.S. section of the commission, and, and he, what, he, what he said was, um, in his closing statement, the commission is viewed with great concern and misgiving the fact that development continues in vulnerable areas of shorelines of the Great Lakes, including Lake Ontario. I do not believe that adequate information is available, particularly on historical erosion rates to enable the present or prospective shoreline property owner uh, the proper development of his property. Okay, um, so in doing so, he's really uh, making an, an emphatic call for what we now call coastal resiliency, right? The flow of information, um, designing to be resilient against storms, uh, looking at the threats that are that are in front of you, and and, and designing for the realm, the range of possibilities, um, and you know, preventing similar impacts in the future will depend a great deal on this on this flow of information and of course land use management, strategic planning, um, and emergency response. Right? So when we were at we were, we were given testimony in Wayne County, um, you know, that was one of the, the headlines was about preventing this type of devastation from ever happening. Right? And what's what is my what is my theme? What is my, my main message? Water regulation can't do that alone. So what is the most effective use of time and resources? Land use management, coastal resiliency, emergency response. And I'll leave you with an image. Um, we call this uh, a mechanism for evapotranspiration off the lakes. I call that lake effect snow. <laughs> um, but, that's, but this is still happening right now, right? These are, these are hydrologic conditions at work. That I have. Yeah.